What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode six of Gatekeeper Media's In the Mix with Park Podcast. My name is Mitch Phillips. Joining me as a co-host, Mr. Zach Harrison. What's up, brother? How are you? Doing really well. Doing really well. Had a better disc golf experience this weekend. You had many disc golf experiences this weekend. You were in Charlotte, North Carolina. Shout out to everyone in the Charlotte area. And you yeah. played how many courses this weekend? Uh, three. Three different courses. We wanted the fourth, ah. but after three in a row and two of the longest courses that I've ever played back to back, we were ready to just wrap it up and, and get our butts home. Yeah. And you were there just with a bro trip, got to enjoy the weekend, yeah. get some good, good drinks, good food, good disc golf. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the courses were a blast. We played Eastway or Beastway. We played, um, Hornet's Nest, of course, can't miss that one. And then we played Nevin, mm-hmm. which was actually a Holly Findlay recommendation. Okay, nice. So that was kind of cool. Shout out to Holly. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Loved all three of those courses. Um, really tested your woods golf. So yeah. had to be technical, had to had to hit your lines and shape your shots. And um, I shot really well. So it was definitely course a, records a at all three, which is amazing. I mean, <laughs> gosh, you guys are lucky. I mean, we got course record setter here, Zach Harrison. Hey, I mean, just I absolute legend. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Check you disc. Maybe it is true. Um, follow him over on Instagram. You know, maybe we'll find out. Um, but this week we are in, man, this is an exciting week because we're in Emporia, Kansas for the dynamic discs open. Um, what a week, not just a weekend, not just uh, this, this tournament is not just about the, the four rounds, the three rounds that are played. It is about so much more than that. Uh, talk a little about what happens in Kansas, the importance of what this is to the city, some of the things that go on. Yeah, absolutely. So I think James Conrad said it the best. You don't get really excited to go to Kansas. Not not to, <laughs> not to hate on Kansas. Sorry, but Kansas. No, not to hate on Kansas. There's, you know, he's, he's just, of all the places we travel, Kansas is not the most exciting. But once you get to Emporia, it's like, a brand new world mm-hmm. where everyone knows the pros. You feel like a celebrity when yeah. you walk around town and there are murals of disc golf baskets all around the city. And so what they end up doing is the whole week prior to the event, starting on the Saturday before the tournament begins, they have C tier tournaments like at flex starts, yeah. Flex starts at local local courses. They do mini disc tournaments every day. They've got disc dying classes. They do things like putting contests and they have a poker party and a block party and they have live music. So it's it's literally a festival. You go out there, if you're one of the spectators, there's so much more to do than just watch the pros play. And that is what I think draws so many people to Emporia. Yeah, I mean, and there's the entire AM side of the Dynamic Disc Open that happens as well. I believe there's like 700 people. So it's like it's over 500 people that you know that are entered into that. Wow. That's on top of the flex starts. I mean, the obviously Dynamic Discs being ho- the home there in Emporia, they've really taken over the city. Like you said, there's local businesses that yeah. are like free free drinks to disc golfers, free bowling to disc golfers. I mean, like it's so cool to see the like impact that dynamic disc has had on the city and what it's done to the infrastructure of a town and just what it shows is like kind of sets the standard for a smaller town for our sport that just says hey what does it look like to partner as one and make this an amazing place to come it kind of has become in my opinion the mecca of disc golf tournaments you're not wrong you're not i mean especially for the courses that they play which Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about of course but um yeah it's just an amazing thing to see that they're making it more than just disc golf it's the community which i think i speak for a lot of disc golfers when they say that, you know, they got into the sport, but the community is what really got yeah. them to love disc golf. Yeah. Not, it's the people I'm, that you would never have a common ground with, um, in any other way other than what we do and play disc golf. So I think it just, like you said, I think it just represents our sport so well. The only other one being, I guess, fall fest, uh, at GMC, but it's not mm-hmm. necessarily the whole town. It's more of like, that's on a property at right. smugglers not. So just, just a unique place. So if you've never been to the dynamics, this open, definitely go. I cannot wait to go there myself for the world championships later on this year. Um, I'm going to try to get Zach to come with me. We'll see. Um, but Man, let's talk about these courses. We had a brand new course, um, brand new course in the way of which we've seen a lot of these holes before um, in Jones Gold, Jones East. Uh, but this is an Eric McCabe design course called the Jones Supreme, the Supreme 18, over 10,000 feet, kind of a combination of every other iteration of this property that it has been. And my goodness, a quote from Jeremy Colling during this was the average score of round two was plus five. If you were shooting under par, you were amazing. 
I mean, we'll talk about it a lot in a, a whole segment. We're going to talk about the scoring, but just that alone yeah. for a course that's brand new to the tour, a course that's going to be played for the world championships. Just give me a quick synopsis of that course and then we'll, we'll move on. We'll talk a little about it later. The course itself. Yeah. I mean, one, it's wicked long. Mm-hmm. If you guys didn't catch that over 10,000 feet, yeah. that's insane. That's insane. Go look up your local course, and I guarantee it's probably 5,000. Maybe you get some in the six, 7,000. Right. But 10,000 feet, insanely mm-hmm. long. Tons and tons of OB. OB is everywhere. Inside it's, the circle. I mean, everywhere. You, if, if you can avoid OB, you are gaining strokes a lot of the time on the field. Um, so long and technical. That's what we're looking at here. Yeah. And moving into the other course we had. So during rounds three and four, the Emporia Country Club coming in at a whopping 11,244 feet. Uh, same par, both being par 65. Um, but we know Emporia Country Club, not too many changes were made to the course. A little bit, some tee pads moved by a little bit, baskets moved by a little bit, and that OB changed just to make it more and more difficult. Um, but what makes these courses so incredibly just ridiculous is the wind. We are in Kansas in the end of April, early May. Every year we come here, you expect it. And uh, this year we had this cool thing that was a tornado watch. Uh, just joined the party, decided to, to come in and uh, yeah. Dude, just- the tornado came in. <laughs> Like, I, it didn't, to, to, to make sure there wasn't actually a tornado it did not happen but well, we were on a tornado watch there was a tornado in kansas yeah in kansas but not it at wasn't the tournament. at the yeah, tournament yeah. No. there's a, it's it's a tuesday and there's a tornado in kansas that's like a normal thing isn't it it's yeah. like the whole point of wizard of oz is like there's tornadoes yeah. in it yeah yeah and the u.s <laughs> just breeds tornadoes to begin with so. yeah the midwest <laughs> um but yeah i mean the the winds were yeah 30 plus miles an hour mm-hmm. and you had that to was throw. constant i feel like for it, some of the oh, rounds. Yeah. final round was a little more calm but that was Definitely. like constant it wasn't like oh there's 30 mile per hour gusts every now and then no it was that was like the minimum no and like hold your hat or else it's falling away yeah don't even think about having an umbrella open <laughs> you know yeah. i mean keep your dress down or else you're going to go Marilyn monroe like this was serious <laughs> it was this no was serious it was it was I mean, you expect it. There are some players that are like, I literally hate coming here for this reason. It changes the way the sport's played, blah, 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 blah. I like it. I think it challenges the players in a way that you don't see it challenges. We get low scores. We get some highlight reels and some completely fail reels of stuff going on. Um, But yeah, I mean, a tournament in which being under par was a good thing, which is usually true, but this was a really good thing. Um, We'll talk a little bit more when we continue on, but just kind of what we're going to be getting into. But before we do all that, we're going to run it back with Idio Sports as we do. Take a run back. If you're here on your tube, we're actually on, uh, what are they called? Not escalators. Uh, what are the running things? Treadmills. Treadmills. We're, we're running it, setting personal best. We've been doing it the whole time. Head over to YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, get you for media. And we are going to be running it back. Uh, with video sports Uh, if you haven't heard of video sports they are the first ever disc golf shoe created for disc golfers by disc golfers um head over to idiosports.com to get your pair of disc golf history those are going to be coming into your hands into your front porches and or doors so so soon this month is the plan zach is so hyped so Um, pumped i've been thankful to be able to have mine for a little bit now and i'm just absolutely loving them so head over there but let's run it back um to before the tournament usually in this segment we'll talk about some history of the tournament uh, maybe history of the property some cool things that went on but this is going to go to the final practice round where mr matt bell threw an ace on hole 16 for how much money zach this is a grand total of 25 thousand dollars thousand twenty five thousand dollars quick maths that's like more than if you won three pro tour events this year that's like like that's like half of a teacher salary uh, more than more than half over half states. a teacher yeah. salary yeah <laughs> most <real>. places <laughs> goodness so yeah taking it down hole 16 at the Emporia country club with his own tour series disc that's like that's like listening to your own beats at your own house just bobbing your own head and just sitting there and going man these beats are sick like i mean that's the level of like i threw my own disc for this hole and made it happen so thought space athletics his tour series synapse i mean the disc is good go out and get yourself one it's pretty obvious they're that pretty amazing discs. at least at 320 feet to an island green i mean island green go short go long go left go right you're in the water you might even lose your disc oh you're gonna lose a disc i i, I would guarantee Every person who played or practiced on that that hole lost a disc this week. I would guarantee it. You think there's anyone out there raking those in? 
Oh, they have to be. There's people in kayaks and stuff trying to catch them, I'm sure, if they're <laughs> just outside the camera. No. <laughs> San Francisco um, baseball yeah. style. <laughs> yes. Um, but what this came from and the sponsorship of this $25,000 came from a uh, nonprofit called ERIC, uh, which stands for Early Recognition is Critical. So a little about them, we want to shout them out. Um, so it was founded in 2012 by two friends whose lives have been changed by their loved ones whose fights with cancer. Um, ERIC is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to save lives by recognizing cancer early on. Uh, in their first decade, they have gained, they've gone to hundreds of schools and shared their speak up message with over 200,000 middle school age children. Wow. Um, and that message being to live an active, healthy lifestyle and to speak up and tell someone if something doesn't feel right. Um, they've accomplished all of this and most of this through the help of the, of their flying disc community, us being disc golf, uh, and the joy of sharing Frisbee flight along with age appropriate cancer symptom content. So just an amazing way to partner our sport with something that matters so much. Um, and to Matt Bell specifically, um, this is something that just like touched my heart. It gives me chills just yeah. thinking about it. Um, this is a quote from him after he had thrown it in. He said, uh, my girlfriend's uncle, who was basically her dad and raised her for most of her life, actually passed away from cancer last week. Um, so I told her family um, that I would be paying t- for the entire funeral costs. Uh, it was incredibly special to have them be able to be a part of that. Um, so just, I mean, it honestly like makes me almost tear up, like that level of could happen to anyone, but the way in which that happened for Matt and for his family in that way is amazing. Um, thank you to Eric for sponsoring this and for bringing awareness to such a huge, huge, I mean, there's no words for the level of what cancer is in our society and as humans. Um, so thank you to them for sponsoring this whole at such an amazing dollar amount for our sport and what they do and what Frisbee as a whole does for um, for the, the push of that nonprofit movement. So definitely shout out to you, Matt Bell. And uh, yeah, that's our Run It Back with Video Sports this week. Uh, be sure to head over to idiosports.com to be able to get yourself a pair of the disc golf shoes. Whew, they're good. And it's going to be amazing to see everyone get those. Also, Got a shout out to Blair Orn, who did hit also hit the ace just less than 24 hours before on that whole day so before so the final close. practice round, getting the ace, knowing yeah. that if you would have hit it tomorrow, right. 25K in the bank account. Yeah, but you, know, you, got, you got the shout out. He was the one who hit it first. You know, there was there was a the couple original. more throughout the weekend. He was the first. <laughs> he was number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Running um, it back. With running it back. <laughs> Heck yeah. Run it back to number one, Blair Orn. First ace of 16. Oh, man. Um, well, let's continue on here. Um, something that was kind of surprising um, that happened in the this tournament at the Dynamic Disc Open was COVID kind of making a comeback. Uh, we had four mm-hmm. players drop out after testing positive from COVID-19 during round two specifically. Uh, those being Tristan Tanner, Matt Oram, Colton Montgomery, and a fourth player who chose not to be identified. Um, but just a little update on them. Tristan ended up dropping out um, during round two. He had body aches, and he said he could barely walk. Oh Went to gosh. the ER. I mean, it was just feeling awful. Um, he's apparently doing better now. Matty O also um, tested positive. He's feeling fine, but is taking necessary precautions. And Colton Montgomery doing all right as well. Um, Kona, his fiance, also tested negative, So, but dropped out just due to safety. So respect for that. So um, just want to read this, too, about this. Um, the Disc Golf Pro Tour definitely um, – taking this seriously as it's kind of feel like we're kind of past COVID, but then all of a sudden it's kind of made this kind of resurgence. Um, so the disc golf pro tour, uh, did say the process for contact tracing has already been followed. Uh, that's coming from Charles McCracken, the disc golf pro tour communications director, uh, communications manager at this point are testing everyone that these players have had close contact with and players who are in close contact with anyone who has tested positive must get a negative test before being allowed to tee off before round three. So this was obviously a little bit before that. This is Mark um, Right, but the Disc Golf Pro Tour is continuing to evaluate the much uh, the spread of COVID-19 and what's taking place during this event, and they haven't ruled out any kind of cancellation of play or anything like that. Obviously, this that was, this is an article from Multi World uh, when this had first happened. Obviously, there wasn't any cancellation to play, sure. um, but just the fact that Disc Golf Pro Tour is taking all those necessary precautions to be able to make sure everything's moving forward. They're playing it smart. Yeah, you know, getting everyone tested negative. That's that's the way to make sure that everyone is safe. Right. Everyone can be confident going out and just focusing on golf. You know, that's what we want, and that's what their job is. Right. We want the players to be able to focus on the game. So, props to to the DGPT. Yeah. Um, for handling that, and it's definitely a bummer that some of those players had to drop out, but everyone else was able to get their test and move on and keep playing the golf. 
Yeah, it's definitely good. And like you said, to be able to move forward, knowing that this is still a thing, like it was a global pandemic, like it's still happening. Yep. Uh, thankfully, we have you know the ability to track it and to be smart about it as we continue on. So definitely good to hear that. I hope that the four of those uh, players and also anyone else that came in contact are doing okay and they heal up well uh, and are able to continue on with the Pro Tour. Um, so let's get into the Dynamic Discs Open. Just some big talking points, man. There was so many. Hit me with the first one. Um, the, the fact that you could go in and shoot around over par and still climb up the leaderboard. This, I <laughs> it just, if it, anyone knows yeah. the last time this, this has happened, I, yeah, I don't know, know the last time this happened. No. Um, I'd be curious to see maybe successive tournaments where the wind was just crazy and someone shooting over par was on the lead card. Yeah. I mean, I, we had on the final day of MPO shooting even for the tournament puts you on the lead card. Logan Harpool, I believe, was even, and he was on the lead card for MPO final round. You know, I've, I've in the last couple of weeks, I've heard some people talking about maybe the courses should be tougher. I think it was actually specifically W.R. Jackson that people made this comment about when Paul went and shot that 16 under, a couple of people were questioning, why are these courses not more difficult? Mm-hmm. Why are we not making them play harder courses? Which is kind of funny because Paul did shoot over par the day before. He sure so, did. That's really funny. Like, so he, he, he kind of point made, but continue. But, but we're here, and now we see the struggle. Mm-hmm. We see really what a challenging disc golf course is. Yeah. Uh, conditions aside. Right. Conditions aside. What is a very challenging disc golf course for the best in the game? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's hard for me not to compare it to the Masters. Right. Because you see some guys get out there and shoot seven down, super hot rounds, but the majority of the field is over par. Right. And I think... At one of the most prestigious events in golf. In golf, right? right. And so I think if we can lean that direction where there is maybe a bigger difference between mm-hmm. highs and lows and yeah. having to work back maybe even more difficult than it once was, or you know, like Paul where he had that huge swing... Um, and to shoot that minus 16 at, at WR Jackson. I don't know. I, I like the idea of making these courses this difficult, even yeah. though maybe some of the players aren't super stoked about it's it. True. Um, but, uh, what from else, a, from what a stats want, side of things, I think it, it brings excitement. It brings confusion. It brings, I mean, a talking point that we have right now on this podcast. I'm sure we're not the only one that is going to be um, having this conversation. I'm sure you're having this conversation if you're listening to this with some friends. Like, did you see that? Ricky shot over par that these guys shot over par. I mean, like, it's just, it's crazy to see that. I think there's some ways in which this can be done, but it has to be done smart um, and done in a good manner because uh, there was, I mean, was it, I forget which hole it was at at a a country club that was like a, almost a 600 foot par three. Like, I don't think that's the way to say, Hey, we're going to pull everything closer to par so that par used to be soft par fours or now par threes. Like, I don't know. What's your opinion on that? Like, is there ways in which we can do that? without changing full course design or does it really come down to what does the future of our sport look like with that mindset like moving forward with the design yeah it's definitely going to have to be a little bit of distance Mm -hmm. right i I think that's one of the biggest ways to make the course harder is to make it longer um you know you can't really modify the grounds that you're playing on so it's going to be the distance it's going to be where it is located in relation to any sort of obstacle and then it's going to be what out of bounds are you going to create yeah because a lot of this was not any sort of natural ob Mm -hmm. it was a man-made marked ob right so if people are willing to put in the time and the energy to make their own ob's then this is i think the way that golf is going to start moving Mm -hmm. um whether it be by shaving the fairways you know, smaller grass on the fairway and out of bounds is like a rough, like you would see in the game of ball golf or it's but like, obviously in our sport, you're penalized for that oh, compared yeah. to, Oh, you're in the rough. You have a bad lie. It's like, no, now if you're in the rough, you're actually gaining, you're gaining. losing a stroke. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, it's a good point. I think there's a way in which to do it where you can mark those, or maybe now we think this in mind and you saw it even at, uh, at Jones where it was like, Hey, where there wasn't grass, there was out of bounds uh, or Hey, let's let this grass grow in certain ways to make that kind of natural OB right. be- become that itself. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think that was just shocking to see, like yeah. to see that you had, uh, players that were like on lead cards that shot way over par the day before, but like we're still in contention. The whole field averaging plus five from round two, 
like that was the, the average score yeah. was plus five. I personally like it. I don't know yeah. how the players feel about it. If if any players are listening and want to throw in their two cents, let us like what did you think of the course? Mm-hmm. I was not there. I did not play it. But from an outsider's perspective, I think the only negative thing I would say is that watching it live was tough it was because brutal. because you're watching these people struggle mm-hmm. and we're not really used to that we're used to seeing people get out there and just shred right and like every now and then someone blows up and they kind of have a bad round but this was the whole field yeah like everyone was having some really really challenging rounds yeah and i mean you had players taking double digit scores uh albert tom took a 14 in round one I mean, that was the worst score I saw. Um, and no, I mean, Albert, Albert, you're a good buddy of mine. I respect you, buddy. But yeah, uh, <laughs> shout always. out to you, brother. But he ended up shooting incredible rounds after that and doing really well. But the fact that that was even possible and the main thing of it, our next point being wind. Uh, we talked yeah. about a little bit in the preview here of this episode. Uh, the wind conditions here, I mean, we had the tornado watch. I mean, there was some crazy things going on. Talk. About, I mean, let's, let's chat about playing in the wind what that can do to a player. And we heard, you know, earlier in the season, there's some people that have been pretty vocal, like, oh, when it rains, I don't really want to go play. But guess what? When you're in a pro tour event, when you're at an elite series spot, it's pouring rain. Guess who succeeds? Those people that practice in the rain. Practicing in the so rain. it's saying, are we now going to see players purposely going to Kansas early on? Or are we going to see you know, maybe the removal of it? I don't know. Or the fact that I don't think it's going anywhere, though. That no. discs open being such a big thing. My point being, Playing in the wind, it's got to be something you prepare for, and it's got to be something that you're expecting. 100%. You know, it's, I mean, I going to Kansas, I'm probably going to bring the heaviest discs I own, mm-hmm. more overstable than understable, so I know that it's still going to shape itself the way that I anticipate it to. But, I mean, like you said, it comes down to practice. Yeah. Can you practice? I think it also kind of lends itself maybe a little bit better toward the spin putters because yeah. if you do putting's a whole nother thing if you yeah. do end up in a headwind you have to spin right like you can't nose down putt in a headwind mm-hmm. unless you're throwing it 20 feet in the air right um so you i mean you kind of hear people i go out in the wind if if it's a windy day i don't not practice yeah if i'm feeling masochistic i just go for it i figure <laughs> out i figure out yeah. what's working and what's not working right you know, that's what practice is for. It's of course. Make your mistakes on the practice screens yeah. instead of in the tournament situation. So I know the pros. Mm-hmm. Most of them would be practicing oh, of course. in windy conditions. Yeah. And I think, like you said, you know, maybe you do go out there in the rain and you putt and see how can I grip this in in the rain with no towel. Right. Right? Like what happens worst case scenario, your towel is soaked. You're umbrella breaks or something and you're out there drenched you still have to play of course you know unless you're going to take a dnf which that's not fun because you just you have no chance so yeah i mean the wind is not easy because it's so unpredictable you know it's always going to be different sometimes it's in different directions at the same time and you kind of have to just trust what you know. Yeah. I think, I think it's a good way to end that. And I want to wrap the wind point up here. Um, and we'll talk about it more. I'm sure. But this point specifically, um, it was said, I believe it was on Joe They're talking about the difference. I think it was Paul Ulibar who brought it up saying that James Conrad and players like him are excelling in the wind here because they throw naturally overstable discs on and the disc stays on the line that they release out of their hand the whole way and it shapes that compared to players um, that are more hyzer flip reliant or more I'm going to let the disc do the work and like make the you know throw an understable disc on an angle let it move and there's that ex- expectation of this disc is going to do this shape because I threw it this way you look at someone like James Conrad that goes out and throws quite overstable discs on anhyzers on hyzers and when that disc comes out of his hand it stays on that line for the whole flight that that's his expectation so I think it's also a, a stylistically there's just some players who excel in the wind based on how they play Absolutely. and of course you have that kind of upper hand coming in but it's also like hey you grew up on the east coast so you're a really good woods player hey you have a ton of power so you play really well in the open I mean our sport lends itself hence the big word I mean tour of it's you're going to have players that are going to excel in some areas other than not Mm -hmm. but this one definitely being you have the woods you have the open but then you have the wind and I think that's now we've seen it in this tournament we're going to see it more this this year coming back here for the world championships how this affects players and how do they come back here when it really matters for a major 
That's what I'm excited to see. How do they take this as a learning experience, readjust what they thought was going to happen, mm-hmm. and come back maybe with a totally different game plan? Yep, because we're coming back here the last week of August right into the first week of September for the World Championships on these two courses. I'm not sure at the time of this recording, uh, it's Monday, May 2nd, there has not been anything said of some changes happening. I don't know. I would be surprised if there were any, if not very small ones, maybe to some spectator areas, maybe to mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But this is a world. This is our world's preview. This is what we're expecting to see on these courses for these players. And we had some pretty outstanding wins. I mean, Ricky Wysocki winning by six strokes. Yep. And I mean, Kristen Tatar was ahead for a majority of it, had a rough round three um, and, you know, only one by one. But let's talk a little about scoring kind of as we talk about the world's preview. Even, we already said this, even through three rounds makes a lead card and final round at MPO. I love it. I think there's something crazy about it that you have to shoot. I mean, we don't really have the word like scratch golfer in disc golf, but it kind of felt like that. If you're a, a, a scratch golfer, if you can play what the course is giving you and you can stay consistent and be close to par you're rewarded for it this weekend i think one of the easiest ways to stay clean out there was to avoid the ob's mm-hmm. with all that ob if, the more you avoid the easier your life is going to get because all it does is just add strokes and weigh you down oh that's a good word that's a good word add <laughs> strokes it weighs you down <laughs> stay away from the out of bounds goodness oh man <laughs> No, that's that's gonna be in my sermon when I when <laughs> I disc op- golf preacher over here. When I open the United Church of Disc Golf, that will be a part of it. I'm telling you, you guys avoid the OBs. Avoid the OBs. All it's gonna do is weigh you down. So Ooh, that's I mean a good word. just just to say it, we saw hefty OB penalties. We Ju- Drew Gibson had the most OBs in the MPO field at twenty five strokes over all four rounds. OB strokes on the tournament. Twenty five. <laughs> I get upset when I throw two OB strokes, one OB stroke. I don't know what I would do if I'm out there throwing multiple each round. And not far behind him, another big name, Anthony Barella at 24 out-of-bound strokes, but both of them finishing in the top, below the top 30. They have 26 and 24th, I believe they were. I don't know how they did that. Bounce back percentage. The bounce back. I mean, the amount of birdies obviously way outweighing that, but... The fact that the mental game, I think, let's, let's talk about this for a second. Drew Gibson used to be known as someone whose mental game was not great. His mm. putting was not great. Those are his, his, his weaknesses. What a turn that has been made. That He had the most OB in the tournament, fought back, and still placed in the top 30. That's incredible. Well done, Drew, for that. Yeah, like that is amazing. such an amazing stat to hear and to be able to, to go on. And I mean, that's something that you, that's, that's what goes in a social post. And you go, damn, I, I, Played, had the worst out of bounds strokes, could not keep in the fairway, but I fought back and I made it to here. So I think it's awesome to see that. Um, the least out of bounds was Tim Barham at only nine strokes. Unreal. Which, which is for a normal, a, a normal turn, <laughs> for a non windy, these courses with the amount of out of bounds that were there, you would think that's a lot. But yes, that's the least. And I mean, and Tim finished, I mean, just outside of those top 50 or so. It wasn't a great finish, but. It was still the fact that, like, that's what it took. Right. It's, I mean, even at nine out of bounds, it was still there. And the FPO only had eight. Lauren Butler had eight for FPO as the least, and Maria Oliva at 31. And Maria, she finished, actually, in the top 30 as well, I believe. She did. Yeah. Um, she finished, yeah, top 23. 23. There were only 25 players in the FPO field, but still. Mm. To be, I mean, at the that level and still be able to, you know, perform and be, I mean, in the the – the mix a little bit of that but it just goes to show it's still able to happen yeah with the amount of strokes i think it's just a mental game i think that's the biggest thing that this had to be as a player yeah. the mental side of it was just ridiculous being able to shake off the previous throw get your mind on the next executed thing you have to actually make happen right i mean this that's that's a great lesson for all the golfers out there but yeah. but gosh man like it's almost an expectation at some point you're getting pushed OB. Yeah, and it, we saw it so much. There were holes on the FPO side that averaged a stroke and a half over par. Hole seven, I believe it was. Yeah, mm. stroke and a half over par, both round one and two. Like, stroke and a half over par. I mean, that's how brutal the out-of-bound. We saw it, we talked about it earlier. Albert Tom taking a 14. I mean, these big yeah. names taking 
tens, elevens. That's crazy. Um, let's jump into the MPO recap. Uh, that's kind of some storyline, something we want to start doing before we get into the leaderboard. You can look at the leaderboard. You can see who, who did great. We'll, get, we'll kind of jump through that now. But, you know, if you have any storylines, you have anything, reach out to us at Parked Podcast uh, or at Gatekeeper Media on Instagram um, and let us know some some storylines, some like ideas, some things that you have. We'd love to break them down. And we'd love to get to the point here on the show where we can have you guys write in, do some Instagram story stuff and be able to get some ideas of what we want to talk about here. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Ask us some questions. Definitely. Let's jump into the MPO. I want to start it off, obviously, Ricky Wysocki taking it down by six. I mean, his home course. You did I call it. it. Uh, I was I was looking forward. I, he was in my tops. This is where he won his yeah. first world title. It's it's, it wasn't place. a hard pick. No, not it at all. It was an easy pick. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's like picking the Warriors in, back in 2016. It's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to happen. Uh, 2022? Let us know in the comments. Um, anyway, uh, hot take. But um, so many talented players behind Ricky Wysocki. Names we haven't heard of. Logan Harpool, Jake Hebenheimer, uh, where are we at? Uh, Nolan Ramser, Elijah Bickle. I mean, making the lead card, guys that you never really had heard of or maybe had heard of if you were a local player, yeah. was really cool to see. We've seen that across a couple of the tournaments, but this one specifically because it was the guys that were making these lo- these cards were local guys. Yeah. Were guys that go, this wind is something I'm used to. Right. Like, talk about that. I mean, your opinion on obviously the tour card and how that's changed in which we have a consistent players that are invited to tournaments and do that. But as our sport grows, the importance of, I mean, Logan Harpool is a high school teacher and he made lead card final day. Like, I mean, that's cool. I mean, that's, I think it's good for our sport. Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, everyone loves the underdog. Right. Right. And, and I personally like watching my favorite plow, plows, my favorite pros. (laughs) I love the plows. I love my plows. Um, (laughs) watching my favorite pros play but however i've seen them so many times it's sometimes really really nice to get a fresh face out there Mm -hmm. watch some different form yeah people who throw the disc differently forehand backhand or putting for (laughs) example jake hebenheimer if you guys watched any coverage you saw him throw his putts like he's throwing cornhole it was more cornhole than it was horseshoe i feel like horseshoe yeah. cornhole bowling yeah. it's all it's that <laughs> underhand from the side motion with your opposite foot stepping forward yeah. it was completely legal oh yeah like absolutely. the way in which he did it but. absolutely stepping up to the disc and and giving it a toss i actually gave this a shot i saw him doing it this <laughs> yes. morning i put my practice basket you're not outside. the only one you know everyone's absolutely doing not. it, I, it I think so many people get out there yeah. and they're like, I gotta give this hey, a shot. Ta- tag the guy on Instagram. How he would freaking <laughs> love it, I'm sure. So I I started trying it and it wasn't bad. I was pretty much on the pole most of the time, but mm-hmm. what I noticed was every single one of my discs came out nose down. Yep. Nose down the whole way. So <laughs> it um I really had to trust the height of my disc. Yeah. And it was hard to change the angles. Mm-hmm. The angles, I think, obviously he's been practicing that for a long time. But, you know, if, if you're a spin putter yeah. and you don't know how to throw nose down. There you go. Maybe you it's just a wrist angle. And it's something that we have to backs. do all the time. I mean, I've done it. I'm I'm a straddle putter most of the time. Like, I do not putt like that. But when I've had to get around a tree, I've had to putt some kind of yeah. weird like that. So it was cool to see that. I think it brings, like, I mean, Jake Hebenheimer t- finishing the tournament tied for third. I mean, it's incredible to see a local name, a name that's that's somewhat known in the community. Another one, Logan Harpool tied for third. High school teacher in Kansas. Yeah. I mean, he was a baseball, a college baseball player. So definitely athleticism there. Had an amazing forehand. But to see these guys jump up and finish in the top was amazing. Let's continue down the leaderboard. Simon Lazat, second place. Love to see Simon coming back. Yeah. I mean, the last time I talked to Simon was at Champions Cup and he was not happy with his round. He was like, and eh, it was what it is. But for him to say, he is like, I love the way my game is going. I'm finding confidence. And for him to be second and have a podium finish at an Elite Series event, dude, it has been what, five years probably? It's yeah. been a long time. Yeah. And now he's a dad. So there's a lot more going on in yeah, his there's life. There's a way he, to he's, that. He's like, not just focusing yeah. all his energy on on golf right now. Um, but he came out there and ripped it. And honestly, watching him, I think what stood out to me the most is that his putting was magnificent. Mm-hmm. I mean, everyone knows, maybe not everybody, but if you've watched Simon putt at all, his spin putts are unbelievable. 
Yeah. If you've ever seen it in person too, uh, it, it he doesn't move his wrist. No. It, it is this like tiny little snap and it just goes. It flies right out of his hand and, mm-hmm. and he was giving so many of the baskets these floaty little bids and a lot of the time it was hitting the chains so softly. It's like it was almost caressing the yep. chains and just landing into the basket. So that was really, really yeah. awesome to a- watch. Another player putting we got to see on the league card was Thomas Gilbert. It was awesome to see him, the yes. grind he has put in, the support from Canada uh, and everything on him. He was hitting some huge putts. Oh, my gosh. 50-footers. He had the longest putt, I would believe it was. I think it was hole six uh, at, on round two, I believe it was. Had like a 50-footer to the raised basket. Just It's that putting style. Like we yeah. talked about how important it is to have that nose up, spin putt, and, I mean, you do it. Another guy, amazing Hot take. I think he's the best putter in Europe. Top three finish. Vinyl Makala. Dude, he is shooting five down on the final day to jump up. I believe it was six spots mm. right around there. I mean, wow. to be able to do that, first European player to have a podium finish in an elite series event on the MPO side. I'm a huge supporter and excited for Vinyl Makala. I love being able to watch him play and just destroy and win the Prodigy Disc Pro Tour over in Finland last year. Um, he was battling an ankle injury, had to drop out of tournaments oh, wow. earlier this year, um, probably shouldn't have even played at Champions Cup. And then to now be able to strengthen, put the work in, change a little bit of his stuff, and to get a top three finish, heck yeah. Like I was messaging with him on Instagram before the tournament and was like, man, excited for you. And he's like, man, I'm just hoping I'm going to be able to finish. I'm excited to do it. And yeah. then he gets a top three finish. So, dude, shout out Vino Makala. That was amazing to see. Absolutely. And I believe running it down the leaderboard, he was the only European in the top 48, second being Nicholas Antala. Uh, Blair yeah. Orn, top 30 being from, I believe, from Iceland. Um, so, I mean, is that Europe? Iceland, Europe? Yes. It is considered Europe? Yes. Geography. Sorry, Blair. Uh, <laughs> love you, bud. <laughs> uh, let's jump down the leaderboard a bit more here. Um, some other names here. Uh, Brody Smith. We saw there was a lot of, I mean, just Brody Smith is a player who came, I mean, he's only been playing for two years. Like yeah. he had the, the Jomez, uh like intro kind of video with him that they did. And it was amazing to see that he really is committed and was on the lead card at a tournament like this. Yeah, I watched a little bit of Brody in the off season. He was he was posting some of his practice routines, mm-hmm. and one of the things that I thought was insanely smart, and I added this to my practice routine, is that he does a a staggered putt, like his his typical staggered putt out from outside the circle. Then he would move to a straddle putt, and then he would move to a stepper putt, and he was draining them yep. consistently. And I I just Lynn, in these conditions you never know where the wind's going to come from. And if it's coming from left, right, or behind you, usually it's a more like pendulum putt that helps you. Yeah. But if it's a headwind, you have to spin it. Or maybe you want to get a stepper and just throw it a little bit nose up. So props to Brody for being able to hold it down, stay pretty clean throughout yeah, the majority sure. of the of the tournament. And like you said, finish up in that top section. So good to see more new faces yeah. up in the, the lead card. Yeah, it is weird to think that like, Brody's still a new face, but he yeah. literally has only been playing disc golf for two years. Right. Um, someone who's not a new face and a big face of our sport, Jeremy Coling, getting that forehand ace on hole 16 as well. Yeah, has a not for $25,000, sorry, Jerm, but to be able to hit the ace nonetheless. Tournament ace yeah, always feels he's good. He's usually the person that's there, and it happens to be there. <laughs> but for him to get one, take it back, that was awesome to be able to see. And on forehand, because uh, I will say there were more throwers on a forehand on coverage than ever before because the wind, <laughs> you were out of your hand, and thrower alert. Germ's, was, Germ's forehand is something spectacular. Oh, it's Im- impeccable. I mean, it's, it belongs in a museum. Yeah, it probably will be one day. It'll I be, hope so. Just, just that motion to put on video to be on repeat. <laughs> It'll be good. Well, let's jump into the FPO. Um, man, did we really have any doubts? I didn't after the the dominance, I mean, that we saw at Jonesboro. The consistency Kristen has Tatar, been amazing. I mean, two back-to-back winning here at Elite Series events. Uh, I think it's going to continue. There was some shakiness and some moments of doubt, but when it mattered, she brought it together to the point where she shot plus six round one, yep. minus six round two. So literally correcting everything that went wrong. 12 strokes. On the harder condition day, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. And to do a 12-stroke turnaround, and then again, plus two, and then minus two in round three and four. So I think that was the epitome of a true winner here. Absolutely. I mean, across MPO and FPO, to battle with yourself. Yeah. 
to shoot that different back and forth and back and forth and to hold on uh, was amazing. I mean, I, I didn't have any doubts. We both said last week, Chris and Tatar is just on a heater. Um, but there were some moments, like I said, of where you were kind of questioning, what do you think is going to happen, you know, as we move forward? And do you think she's going to be able to have that consistency? Or do you think this is something that's kind of worrisome? I would bet a lot of money on her consistency. The way she comes out, we talked about it last week. Her game plan mm -hmm. is don't worry about anyone else. Yeah. Don't worry about the scores. You play the next shot the way you are planning on playing. You right. know, if it if it's play it safe, you're going to play it safe. Or mm -hmm. if you have to make a big run, that's it. You go for it. Right. But again, another podium finish. It's been every single tournament this yep. season. I would not be able to bet on anyone else. Yeah. But if I'm going to bet on anyone else, it's probably going to be Katrina Allen yeah, because no she kidding. came back. And before we jump back, I want to jump back to one more time. The mental battle, we talked about it in the men's side and the overall just storylines of this tournament was how do you come back from mistakes? Tatar wins this tournament shooting even. Plus six, she played two courses, two rounds each. One round plus six, next round minus six. Next course, one round plus two, next, next round minus two. Shooting even. That is the epitome of oh man, I messed up and fixing it to perfection, splitting even on the tournament and winning it. I think that that's an amazing storyline to see. Absolutely. I would love to stat Mando, let us know if that's ever been done before of just the correction back and forth. I doubt it because that is, that's amazing to see that score line of down, up, down, up, and to be even at the end of the day. Being able to shed that bad round, yeah. learn from all of those mistakes and then execute, I... That's a champion. Completely. That is a champion. And a champion, we're going to find out right behind her, like we said, our world champion from last year, Katrina Allen, battled and chased and clawed the entire way. What a tear of a final round. Yeah. I mean, from plus four and plus two, even on the third round, and then to go minus five on the final day to jump all the way up and to keep it in second place and to only lose by one stroke she went what's up six in a row six in a row to start round four she's unstoppable yeah she did get a couple of bogeys in that the middle six mm -hmm. the double bogey on nine definitely hurt but after right after that bounce back holes 12 13 14 yep birdie 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 and then closing it out with another birdie on 17 getting the par on 18 one stroke shy, you have to be proud yeah. of that type of performance. So close. Even though it was just that that close, and they always say that the silver medalist is always the most unhappy because of how close it was yeah, to their Yeah, you think fingertips. back to that one putt or that one little thing. I mean, when it's one stroke, yeah, it's insane. And then, you know, we jump down to our tie for third uh, with Ella Hansen and Emily Beach. It's about seven, yeah, seven strokes, about, uh, roughly about, no, it's this actual statistic. Exactly we're looking at seven. Here. Exactly seven strokes. What a mind, exactly seven strokes uh, plus eight. <laughs> she, those uh, next two women were. So Ella Hansen, back to back podium finishes. Um, yeah. I, I love it. Ella's an incredible person. She works hard. She's definitely getting after it this season. This is, I mean, from being, she was rookie of the year in 2021 and is now showing, hey, I've settled into 2022 and to go back to back podiums is incredible. Um, also tied for third, Emily Beach, a name that is also, I mean, in contention, I would assume already in that rookie of the year because this is her first full tour herself this year. Um, her only round that was under par was round three. And I mean, it goes to show that like she was battling as well. Yeah. I mean, a couple of top 20 finishes already this year, but is learning how to win. You learn how to get when it matters, learn how to close it out with, you know, with birdies and play cleaner down the stretch. You look at her final round. I mean, she had, I mean, minus one with a ton of pars. She had pars the entire front nine. Very clean. Yeah. Just it was a very well. clean round. Um, obviously you want to see more birdies on that front nine, right? It seems to be the more gettable side of the course, but but to get out there through nine, even, mm -hmm. we see it. That is a quality score. Yeah, even for the tournament, won it in, in FPO here. I mean, if you can, in, in those conditions, like I said, I mean, we talked about it with Kristen, being able to battle back mm -hmm. and split the difference and be able to play even golf is what it takes sometimes, even on the men's, even on the men's side as well, which usually you don't see. No. Um, let's chat about that for a second. The difference of MPO to FPO is usually a good amount of strokes, 10 plus, and on a course like this it was only 10 strokes the difference and on the lead card final day the scores were pretty similar very similar which i love to see because it tells us that 
the course is consistent and the changes that we made for FPO from MPO, mm-hmm. giving them a closer basket, right. giving them a closer tee pad maybe, um, but not always, right? Sometimes they're playing the exact same hole, like hole 16, mm-hmm. for example, 320 feet to an island. Yeah, We're using the same tee pad. Um, but also, again, you see an ace on the MPO side. You see an ace on the FPO side. Yeah, it, it. I think McCabe did a really good job of making sure that everything was smooth and that it was a very gettable maybe not gettable, approachable, <laughs> approachable course yeah. for both sides of the spectrum. Right. And I love that. I love being able to see people succeed. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, overall, uh, one player who I expected to succeed and was my pick going into this was Haley King. Uh, she was in control rounds two and rounds one and two, but then in round three shooting plus 10 yeah. and then round four shooting plus one. If she were to have shot even, she would have won the tournament. Yep. In those next two rounds. So, I mean, obviously, you can always think if you would have shot this, but yeah. to see the difficulty, and this is why I think, let's, as we wrap up this podcast here, final thoughts here is this is the World Championship courses. Sure we is. saw even on the women's side win this tournament. We saw I'm only a minus 10 and an even make the lead card. We've harped on that so much. Uh, no pun intended that it was Logan Harp who, uh, that did the even. Um, but that was pretty good, actually. God. That was pretty <laughs> that was, decent. That was good. That was nice. That was quick. Um, but... What are your thoughts that this is? We saw last year, I think, one of my personal favorite world championships in Utah. You had in the woods and you had the open. This, you have two pretty open courses, but because of the out of bounds, they're two very different courses in a lot of ways. But you bring in the conditions. I don't want from Kansas. What does Kansas look like in, you know, beginning of September, late August? I'm not sure. What are your thoughts that this is the world championship course and this is what we're going to see to crown 2022 world champion? I I like it. I I wish we had the woods golf Mm -hmm. because as a world champion not me uh (laughs) if (laughs) if we were to host a world championship i would want it to be i want to see the most well-rounded golfer right that's what i want right i want to know that you can play on the ball golf courses i want to know you can throw the tight lines yeah have the distance but also have the control exactly so i think mckay built wonderful courses yeah they are obviously challenging they're enough to get both mpo and fpo really really working i think when we come back for the worlds the scores will be better yeah i think everyone's going to be able to take this learning experience push in maybe adjust what they brought Mm -hmm. to the tournament and what they expect from the tournament having it having a a different expectation (laughs) is definitely gonna realizing that if i'm shooting plus five i'm not screaming at myself that actually i'm in the mix mentally mentally you have to realize that this is never over until the last hole yeah and so speaking of that as we wrap up gannon burr would have been in podium finish literally on i believe it was 17 or 18 when the last holes had a terrible roll away mm. and ended up knocking him out so literally to the last hole like last hole. it takes that to the last um, hole. but I, I i agree with everything you said i'm excited to come back here i think we'll see a difference in weather hopefully uh being that it is a different season um but it is kansas it is the midwest tornadoes it's what we do uh in kansas but you know we're gonna find out but next on the tour we actually have a little bit of a break from the elite series our next elite series event is the otb open uh, may 20th to the 22nd but before that we have a favorite of many the santa cruz masters cup happening may 13th through 15th um so i mean two great tournaments we're getting into that west coast swing but with santa cruz very wooded course yeah very non west coast-esque course here which i like about that yeah being at Dela, i mean it's it's historic uh i love this tournament it upsets me that it's not on the elite series but it makes sense with some of the additions we've had right um so that's an exciting one to see definitely be checking that out as a silver series i wonder who's gonna miss it who's not i don't have that in front of me at the moment um but i mean what are the dates for the for master's cup master's 13th cup. or 15th so we got a week break uh, and then we'll head into that next, uh, the following week. Uh, I believe it was last year was uh, Adam Hamas took that down. He's had a little bit of a tough season so far, but I would love to see him be able to do that. Great golfer in the woods, a lot of control there. But then we go to OTB Open, which is definitely not in the woods from what I remember. <laughs> uh, it is very open course. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to be a couple of weeks, obviously, but very much an open on the, the ball golf style from what I remember um is am i correct in saying that i'm completely blanking on that course right now i'm almost certain um 
it's more of like a field yeah yeah definitely it's on the on the property yeah yeah um i'm just excited for the west coast side of the tour yep that's that's what i and not that i love it more than anything else but it's just so exciting some of the courses out there are just a blast to watch de la vega obviously yep. one of the most well-known courses on the western half of the united states um uh, and and getting to see the players have to really go after it and compete on on some some different courses you know it's it's I think weather is a little bit nicer. You can expect maybe a little bit less out in California. Right. Um, but they're still going to have to contend with some OBs. They're going to have to contend with water. Um, they're going to have to, you know, work on shaping their shots. I, I think we'll probably still see some crazy over the top shots from, from some of the players, just since, you know, the trees, as they, they get in the way of the fairway. But yeah, I think um, this West coast brings distance, uh, glancing through here through the caddy book, got a par five of 1200 feet on hole nine at the, at Swinson park here. So, I mean, it's gosh. definitely going to bring the distance. Another one, uh, short after that going to be Portland Beaver state fling, you know, you're going to have some of these big bomber courses and that's like, like we've said so many times, this is why it's a tour. Yep. It is. It, and why I love that the pro tour championships comes back to the East coast and says everything that's happened so far, this is what's led us here. These are the points. We'll get into it as we go into the later parts of the year of that there's now qualifiers to play these certain tournaments as we get going yep. further down, which I love. But, uh, man, wrapping it up here, episode six, what a tournament. Dynamic Dis Open, not one just to disappoint. Ricky Wysocki winning his first world championship here. Will it be his third when we come back here in September? I, I think it's hard to say no. Ooh, I got chills. It, <laughs> <laughs> I got chills. <laughs> I, gosh, man, that's... It's wild to think. I literally can't wait mm -hmm. for it to come down because the worlds are just so fun to watch. Oh, yeah. and, and this is going to be a good course to watch it on, too. No doubt. Well, awesome. Well, for all of us here at Gatekeeper Media Park Podcast, my name is Mitch Phillips. Joining me is Zach Harrison. And uh, definitely follow us over on Instagram at Park Podcast. We just hit 1,000 followers. Going to be doing a giveaway for an upper park shift uh, later on this week. Definitely head over there for that. Um, but it's been a joy to be able to be here for Dynamic Disc Open. We're going to take a little bit of a break here. Um, and we will see you guys at the OTB Open in California real soon. 